Welcome back to Politics in Hawaii with Dennis Isaki on Think Tank Hawaii. Today we'll be speaking with Robin Danner, a native Hawaiian leader from the island of Kauai and has lived with Native Hawaiians, Native Americans on Indian reservations and Arctic homelands in Alaska of the Inuit people. We'll be talking about Native Hawaiian advancement and the politics behind it. Robin is highly experienced in finance, investment, affordable housing, and economic development, as well as experience in federal government aid systems and advocacy. I cannot list all the organizations she's involved in, but it will take the whole 30 minutes. So we'll touch upon a few of them later. She continues to dedicate her life to the self-determination of Native people to do this. She has so shown her perseverance, dedication, and knows her way around the political system. Robin, can you tell us some of the things you have done and what are you doing and how politics be a part of it? Well, good afternoon, Dennis. First, uh, let me thank you for inviting me on your show. Uh, a, a pleasant surprise, always nerve wracking, <laughs> um, especially on the top, my favorite topic, uh, yeah. Native wines. Um, I mean, I'm here today in my role, in my more political or policy role as the elect Shaw chairwoman, which is the Sovereign Council of Hawaiian Homestead Associations. It's 34 year old uh, advocacy organization that unifies over 42 different homestead associations across the state. So I work with a lot of uh, Native Hawaiian leaders on trust lands from Oahu to Big Island, Maui, Molokai, uh, et cetera. And so I wanna, if it's all right with you, give a shout out to my fellow council members that are also elected on the Shaw Council, which is Sybil Lopez from Molokai, Uncle Ron Kodani from Hawaii Island, uh, Richard Sue from uh, Oahu, and Keikoa Inamoto from Maui Lanai. Uh, these are the five council folks. Plus, our very own Kipukai Kualii chairs our policy committee. He keeps us uh, straight and uh, on, on, uh, on the straight and narrow road of uh, policy. But to answer your question, um, I don't know, their policy and politics, uh, some people think they're the same. I don't believe they are. Uh, I think that communities role that uh, one of the areas that we can be much, much better at is policy. Policymakers need good ideas. And that's really what policy is. Politics is the art of compromise and usually the domain of, a, of elected officials, whether in the legislative branch at the state or the congressional branch, the legislative branch at, at the federal level. So sometimes we confuse policy versus politics. And I try to teach our homestead leaders that um, we are better suited and we should help our policymakers uh, know what good ideas actually look like uh, for Native Hawaiians and uh, for, for the whole state. In terms of accomplishments, wow. Uh, I'm, policy's fun. Politics is fun. Uh, I tend to like to watch politics and I like to engage in policy, which is to bring good ideas to administrations, to government bodies, to even funding uh, partners across the country on where they should put their investments. So Dennis, to answer your question, I'd say some of the accomplishments of the Shaw, uh, say 20 years ago, we got Native Hawaiians added to a bill called NAHASDA, the Native American Housing Assistance and Self-Determination Act. What did that do? Uh, we worked with Senator Inouye and Senator Akaka. That has funneled over $150 million uh, over the last 20 years directly into the state of Hawaii, doing what? Paying for roads, for unions to uh, build out infrastructure, things of that nature. So 20 years ago, I would probably say uh, Nahasda and working to include Native Hawaiians in many national, federal, Indian programs that are relevant, uh, like community financing, et cetera. Um, Ten years ago, I'd say some of the accomplishments with the Obama administration, uh, probably the most notable that will uh, help Hawaii citizens, but also Native Hawaiians in particular, is uh, for the first time in 100 years, uh, we have federal regulations 
on a 100-year-old federal law called the Hawaiian Homes Commission Act, which created Hawaiian homelands. And uh, it was a thrilling uh, three years of work with President Obama and his administration to bring that into fruition. Um, and then in the Biden and Trump administration, I, I, oh. I understand you went all the way to President Obama himself to, <laughs> to talk to him about it. And uh, you were very successful with doing that. Yes. Um, walking up to the West Wing, I, I, I have to tell you, Dennis, what was in the back of my mind was, do I ask the President of the United States a softball question and get invited to the Christmas party? Or do I ask him the question that when I turn 80 years old, uh, I don't have to wish that I had asked him. So obviously I asked him the question that I really wanted him to take on. And it was nerve wracking and exhilarating at the same time. Darn straights, uh, Barack Obama uh, is an excellent politician, but I think when you engage directly with him, the guy is a policy wonk. He, he really is interested in solutions. Right, you got the... Um... Hawaiian Homestead, uh, Homestead Community Development Corporation you're involved with? Tell us about that. We founded the Homestead Community Development Corporation 12 years ago, uh, right here on Kauai, and it's a statewide organization. Now it has offices on Kauai, on Oahu, uh, also on Maui, and in Washington, D.C. And HCDC essentially is a 501c3 uh, that takes the good ideas of Shaw and Homestead Association leaders brings those ideas into the 501c3 and implements them on the ground, uh, whether that's affordable housing or job creation, community development, uh, basically uh, drafting business plans for every vision that those community leaders have and then, and then deploying that business plan with capitalization and know-how. That's HCDC, I think is gonna be, it's 12 years old, it'll continue to be an important uh, corporation uh, on, on homesteads. What about the Council for Native Hawaiian Advancement? Oh, yeah. That was a 20 year old, uh, I was still in Alaska at that time, wrote the business plan for the Council for Native Hawaiian Advancement, probably what I'm most known for as the founder of CNHA, which was to bring Native Hawaiians together around all disciplines um, whether health or housing or um, education, et cetera, and to have an annual convening, an annual convention of Native Hawaiian nonprofits so that housing developers just sitting next to healthcare providers or sitting next to educators so that Hawaiians could be in the same room uh, talking about the things that we can agree on. And there's a lot that we, that we agree on. Yeah, uh, you mentioned that you're up in Alaska. With, uh, some of our friends up there, up in Barrow, in the Arctic Circle, it's a far, far place to be from uh, warm Hawaii to uh, an Arctic Circle. How was that? Uh, I was happy to get my allotment notice uh, in 1996 from the Department of Hawaiian Homelands when I was up there to to that my name had come up on the list. But I loved every minute of the 20, 25 years uh, that I worked among the Inuit. Uh, leaders, uh, some really giants in the self-determination work uh, and sovereignty work of Native peoples. Um, I ended up uh, being their tribal housing authority executive director, building house, uh, home ownership and rental housing. I ended up being their uh, county, their municipal government uh, director for housing. And of course, my main uh, career background, uh, I spent well over a decade as a uh, uh, the banker uh, in a in a region five million acres um, large, uh, so I really appreciated actually getting to work for a large municipal county government. It gave me from a capitalist. I mean, coming from banking, which is almost pure capitalism, it really uh, helped me understand what it's like to be on the other side uh, in a county government, and then working with the tribe getting to work with the federal government. So I, 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 I can't say enough about the people there. As you know, I'm, I, I think you know some of the leaders there because they are, many people might not know that they really mentored all of us here on Kauai when we started KIUC, right? 
a lot of their yeah. leaders came. Yeah, I um, got to know a lot of those leaders they mentioned. Uh, the National Rural Electric Cooperative Association with uh, Captain Tosh for all this time. Bryce Brower, uh, yeah. you know, they were, they were um, pioneers really in taking the co-op model where a community owns their utility and in their case, water also uh, to deliver uh, to, their, to their communities. And it's, it, was, it was just a random, cool connection, Dennis, that uh, Galvic, uh Inuit leaders would be coming back and forth to Kauai during those early years of forming the Kauai Island Utility Co-op. Okay. Um, okay, and uh, Governor Abercrombie, uh, was it? Governor Abercrombie appointed you to the Native Hawaiian Role Commission? He did. I don't know whether he regrets that. <laughs> I hope not. Uh, he appointed myself and uh, Na'alehu. Uh, Governor Waihe'e is the chair. Uh, Lei Kihoi is on that commission. And that commission uh, still exists today. And its primary purpose is to establish a base role for Native Hawaiians uh, that want to um, organize uh, and, and have sovereignty similar to a state sovereignty, similar to a county sovereignty uh, to represent and uh, really attack the, the challenges with solutions from a Native Hawaiian perspective uh, to, to advancing, not, not just the Hawaiian community, but, but our state. So, um, so where is it going from here in, in the specifics? Well, one of the request that uh, I made to President Obama was around this issue um, and he did approve it. There were, there were three things that I asked, uh, or two things, two things that I asked President Obama to contemplate. Uh, the first was the realization that our Hawaiian, Home, our Hawaiian Homelands Act was passed in 1920, 1921. And normally when a federal law is passed of that magnitude, normally underneath the federal law, you start doing regulations to implement certain sections of the law so that it's uh, consistent. But Prince Kuhio, as you might know, um, who was the champion of the Hawaiian Homes Commission Act, got it passed in 1921, and then he passed away. He died in 1922. And so the champion for the Hawaiian Homelands Act was gone, and no one thought to do the next step, which was regulatory. And so that was my first ask to President Obama was for him to do something that had not been done in nine decades uh, to begin the process of fe uh, promulgating federal regulations over the state of Hawaii, federal regulations over the state of Hawaii in the implementation of the Hawaiian Homes Commission Act. He, he approved the first two regulations ever in nine decades, and there's probably seven to 10 more to be done, which we are advocating for now with the Biden administration. Um, and the second thing that uh, we asked for, or the Shaw asked for was a uh, regulatory process for those Hawaiians, uh, particularly uh, uh, homestead Hawaiians that have a lot to lose, um, but or a regulatory process for those Hawaiians that voluntarily want to um, develop a constitution and stand up a native only uh, government. This is not the same as per se a kingdom or independence, but it would be a native only government to engage on a government to government relationship with federal government. That, and so that too, uh, that took three years of uh, public comments here in Hawaii and also among tribes and uh, among uh, US citizens. And in 2016, President Obama signed uh, both of those, uh, all three of the federal regulations uh, that you just asked me about. Well, we know our friend Clayton He, former Senator and OHA leader. Did you work with him on Hawaiian issues? Incredible. Uh, hard to work with that guy, but... <laughs> Uh, he's probably one of the, uh, what I loved about Senator He is you didn't have to guess where he was. And that is such a blessing. 
Um, sometimes you didn't want to hear what he had to say, but uh, what I appreciated about him as a policymaker, he was a straight shooter. Uh, he would tell you and have the great debates with you, you know, never personal and always a good dialogue. It's really what democracy was all about. And Senator, he uh, champion of education, uh, champion of uh, monitored and proper uh, development on uh, Hawaiian homelands. He he was a joy really to work with, uh, even though you might leave his office and not sure whether you still had your limbs uh, attached. But uh, that guy uh, deserves our respect, always will have my respect. He, he uh, like I said, that I think the most important thing I like is he understood his job was politics. Mine was not. My job was to give him good policy and to argue good policy with him so that we could come out with a good policy making. Well, I hope he's still making good decisions. He's on the parole board right now. Oh, oh, did not know that. Did not know that. <laughs> okay. It's a hard, hard one. Uh, how about Senator Akaka and Akaka bill? What is your take on it? And uh, well, politics it's, in Washington? The Akaka bill, if you're talking about federal recognition. Yeah. Right. And, um, so I was on the original working group uh, with many Hawaiians and uh, national Indian leaders back in 19 or back in 2000 with the first discussion about federal recognition. The Akaka bill is no longer necessary uh, because um, federal recognition is a standing um, by the federal by the federal government um, and President Obama. One of my favorite things that he said to us, he said, no citizen should be invisible to their government. Uh, and so one of the reasons and uh, one of the regulations that he uh, approved was a pathway for federal recognition for any Native Hawaiian, uh, Native Hawaiians that wanted to come together, uh, put together a constitution, ratify it and apply for this government to government relationship. <laughs> It may not be for everyone. I am a strong prop proponent of it. I certainly want it for my children and my grandchildren. That doesn't mean I want it for others. Each, each uh, Hawaiians have to decide for themselves, family by family. So Senator Akaka, uh, beloved. Uh, I met Senator Akaka as a young uh, tribal executive. I was actually building housing uh, for Native Americans and my parents were school teachers in Indian country. So I first met Senator Akaka, not here at home. Uh, I met him uh, in Indian country. Okay, we're at the halfway point. Uh, why don't we take a short break? Thanks for watching uh, Think Tech Hawaii. Welcome back to Think Tech Hawaii with Dennis Isaki and Robin Danner. Okay, uh, Robin, we've uh, skirted around the HHL, Department of Hawaiian Homelands. Uh, will you give us your thoughts? What a powerful agency this tiny, one of the smallest departments in state government could be, could impact uh, Native Hawaiians today and the, the state of Hawaii, the construction industry, the finance industry, tremendous uh, potential uh, 
uh, if we can get DHHL focused, uh, the Shaw and our Shaw leaders are very much looking forward to 2022 because we know democracy is going to deliver uh, to us a new governor. And with a new governor uh, could pretend a new uh, administration at DHHL. And we're hopeful uh, that we will get a governor and a DHHL administration that is far more connected to the brilliance, frankly, the, and the, the very deep expertise of Hawaiian Homestead Association leaders. They're like these wonderful gems that are sitting in, uh, sitting in the sidelines, in the bleachers. And we're looking for a governor, Dennis, uh, that recognizes the talent and the asset that Native Hawaiian Homestead leaders are themselves and to invite them down on the field to bring solutions uh, to the challenges of, of that department. Uh, probably the Shaw is uh, one of the premier experts of not only the Hawaiian Homes Commission Act, but also of the Department of, uh, of Hawaiian Homelands. And we're really hopeful uh, for 2022. Yeah, along the same lines, you know, speaking about uh, sticking to one, uh, the HHL, uh, what about the 50% blood quantum requirement? So the 50% blood quantum uh, is to get an original lease, uh, but the Shaw and many leaders from Molokai to Maui to Kauai worked for seven years, seven years to lower the blood quantum for air, for an air, for what we call successorship. Um, that blood quantum is 25%. But for the last seven years, we have done community organizing, discussion, discussion amongst ourselves. And then we came out with a policy position three years ago and got it passed at the state legislature to lower the blood quantum for successorship to 132nd, which would be roughly 3%. So that passed the Hawaii State Legislature. Want to thank the legislature uh, for that. And now the second step uh, to making that come to fruition is that the U.S. Congress must uh, review that amendment and hopefully they will approve it. And so July 9th of this year, 2021, is the 100 year anniversary and we're, the Shaw has requested that Congressman Kahele, Congressman Case, Senator uh, Hirono, Senator Schatz introduce the Hawaiian Homeland Improvement Act and incorporate that uh, the work uh, at the state legislature incorporate that for adoption and consideration by the full Congress uh, before the next, uh, the midterm elections. While the Democrats control the White House, they control the Senate, they control the House. So we would like to see uh, the Hawaiian Homeland Improvement Act of 2021 be in, introduced and passed, which includes uh, the excellent work of the state legislature two years ago in adopting our blood quantum, uh, reducing the blood quantum to 3% for successors. So they're still going to leave that 50% on the original lessees? Well, I can tell you that 50 percenters like myself, uh, we know that Jonah Kuhio Kalaniana Ole, the father of the Hawaiian Homes Commission Act, he intended the blood quantum to be 132nd. It was the uh, missionary children, the merchants of Hawaii a hundred years ago that they wanted a hundred percent. And of course the Congress uh, split the baby and that's how we ended up with a 50% blood quantum. What I can tell you is that before the 50% blood quantum can be lowered and Shaw and many of us are big proponents for that. But what we know has to happen first, we must quadruple the size of the land trust itself. We must make sure and get improvements at DHHL to do three things really, really well and much better. One, DHHL needs to move money better. They've got to have strengthened procurement skills to move the capital through there uh, to uh, contractors to build out subdivisions and whatnot. Number two, DHHL needs to become a master at moving land, moving the uh, land to the wait list in a very, there are 28,000 on the wait list. And the third thing that we need DHHL to get very, very good at is to move excellent 
efficient, uh, respectful partnerships with homestead association leaders that are elected all across the state. And so, Dennis, I'm saying that uh, we can that to lower the blood quantum, we definitely want to do that, but we're realistic about it. A, we need this state agency to quadruple the size of land. I mean, if you think about it, you're a, you're a surveyor. Can you imagine if your parents inherited to you uh, a 203,000 acre inheritance and a hundred years later, you have the same 203,000 acres? Right. That's just silliness. It's one of the reasons why the Shaw has uh, advocated at the legislature the last four years. This is our fifth year to issue DHGL CIP funds to not only develop the infrastructure, but also to acquire additional land. Um, and so I think it could happen in my lifetime. Um, perhaps I, I would hope that we can get DHHL uh functioning on all pistons, all pistons firing, so that we can get to that day of lowering the blood quantum for original lessees. Yeah, I think it must have been about 30 years ago, uh, the HHL had the accelerated program. They said, we're just gonna give you this land. We're not gonna put the roads. They did a lot of those on the whole like, throughout the state. I guess that didn't go too well, you know, that didn't get, uh, only support for the roads and no roads, so they couldn't build the houses. So I guess. It went well, back. I wanna, I wanna, and they did it again just 10, 15 years ago. The Lingle administration did it again, did the same exact thing. But again, I think I, I'm hopeful that the next governor will bring the Manao and the Ike of Hawaiian leaders themselves on homesteads that are experts because. Uh, we have the answers and, you know, and the and the solutions. To that okay what about the office of foreign affairs oh huh any much office? better i mean i I'm, I'm really optimistic both about dhhl and, and about oh especially dhhl because there's an opportunity for um a new governor and a new direction um so we're we're, we're prepared at the shaw all across the state to get behind a governor by by uh, by the well before the end of this year we're in a position to endorse. Uh, OHA, I am very optimistic also. Uh, you've got new leadership in there, but more importantly, I really like the administration of the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. Uh, I think that Sylvia Hussey is one smart lady. Um, she may not have all the answers, but she has ears. And that is what's major. She is listening to the people. Okay, thanks, Robin. Uh, yeah, we got a lot more to cover, but. Unfortunately, we're running out of time. Uh, you got any closing remarks, Robin? You know, uh, Dennis, on, on the topic of politics and policy for Native Hawaiians, yeah. I guess my closing remarks would be that uh, the future is humongously bright and that one of the areas that we need to get better at as a state, our legislature, our elected leaders, even our county council people, we need to do a better job of becoming educated about the Hawaiian Homes Commission about, Act, about the Hawaii Admissions Act, of which Hawaii became a state as a condition of these certain obligations to Native Hawaiians. And it's in our own Hawaii constitution. So I think the next five years, we need to spend a lot of good time dialoguing with our policymakers uh, to help them. That's our job. Our job is to help them and their job is to listen to constituents and to learn about something that should be very, very basic because it's in the Hawaii Constitution. And that is that, that the state of Hawaii, the 50th state, is one state out of 34 in the country that has an indigenous population. And that is a brilliant, huge opportunity that I believe has not been maximized to its fullest for the benefit of our indigenous people or for our, our entire state. And so my closing remarks would be that I am excited. Sybil, Uncle Ron, Uncle Richard, Auntie Kekoa, we're all excited to be working more directly with the state legislature and legislators uh, to have dialogue about how simple it is to implement the tenets of the Hawaii Admissions Act for the benefit of Native Hawaiians, but also I cannot emphasize this a much, uh, 
enough the, the, the benefit of every resident of Hawaii, uh, that we need to get better at embracing the fact that we are special as a state that has special opportunities uh, because we have an indigenous population within it. Thank you, Robert. Mahalo. Thanks for spending time with us today. Mahalo to Think Tech and its personnel. Please uh, join us two weeks from now for another episode on Think Tech Hawaii. If you like this and other shows, please consider a donation to Think Tech Hawaii. Aloha.